Thank you all for coming tonight and listening to me speak. Um, I want to cover a lot in this time, so I'm going to try not to go too fast, but I do want to cover a lot. Um, I think there's a lot to talk about here, and there's a lot that you can do. I want to, my goal for this session is to not instill fear in you that this is a problem that we cannot overcome because God can overcome any problem. And his grace and his power is so much more powerful than the works of the evil one. And, and he has a plan to deal with this. And I'm not saying I have the plan or I've got the secret answer, but I do have some tips that have worked in my own life. And so I just want to share those with y'all. And also things that, um, you know, I'm not a parent. I haven't had, I don't, I haven't had kids yet, but um, I'm about to in May. Um, <laughs> May 29th, we're having our first boy. And uh, so I just, but what I want to come to you as a, as, a, as a child, you know, when I was a child, what I wished my parents would have done and things that I've had to walk through that were really tough because my parents just didn't know what to do. Um, so that's where I want to come from. I don't want to come across as tell you how to be a parent or tell you what to do with your own child because only you and God can partner together to know the best for thing for your particular kid. So um, if, you, if I say something and you're like, I don't think that applies to little Johnny, <laughs> you're like, feel free to, that's, t that's totally fine. Um, so yeah, so let's get started with prayer. I'm just going to pray really quick. Father, I thank you so much for your unlimited power and love for our kids and for our society, God, and for the world. And I thank you that you are shedding light on this issue and that you are going to rise up against it and address it. And you're going to use us as a body and a church to fight against it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. amen. All right. So, um, so as Tom said, I grew up in Birmingham. I went to Briarwood Christian School uh, from the womb until 12th grade and um, went to Briarwood Church a lot of that time. And then I went to Auburn for a year and I went, uh, ended up graduating at Sanford. So I, I love Birmingham. I love the city and I've been here f as long as I can remember. Um, so I want to give a brief version of my testimony. I, ha I did speak to the parents group bef uh, last fall and kind of went more into my, into my story. But um, basically my story when it comes to pornography and when it comes to sexuality, when I was very young, and I don't even know exactly what the age was, um, there was some abuse that happened to me. There was some sexual abuse that happened to me. And it started this downward spiral um, that led to pornography, that led to other things. Um, I was never personally involved in the human trafficking business, but so which is why I'm going to speak more to kind of how the internet and how technology affects that. Um, but basically, I went under the radar completely. Um, I hid it my entire life. I never told my parents about it. Um, I was seen as the good kid, um, which, you know, your kids may be good kids, but I was a faking it, <laughs> and I was really good at faking it, and that's one of the things that, that pornography and that this temptation does, is it teaches you to start hiding. Um, just like Adam and Eve in the garden, when they sinned, they felt shame, and they hid from God. That's what this does, but on a huge level for a child or for, a, or for a, an adolescent that's been exposed to that, there's an intense feeling of shame that comes over you, like, I am terrible, or like, I've done something really bad, I can't tell anybody about it. So, so I was an expert at hiding, I was, I mean, if you would have asked anybody, I was the stand-up Briarwood kid, and football team, and this and that, and whatever, you know, made good grades, and like, nobody knew what was going on, and so, um, what happened was I, I, I was dealing with a lot of depression behind closed doors, a lot of anxiety. Um, I had intense problems with relationships. Um, I was unable to give and receive love. I mean, I was a wreck, and nobody knew it. And so um, it, what ended up happening was it, it kind of went to a breaking point when I was a freshman at Auburn. Uh, we're actually Aaron over here, and I went to Auburn together a freshman year. But you may not know this, but I sort of had, uh, I had sort of had a mental breakdown towards the end of my freshman year, and because I couldn't handle the real world, like I was not ready. I could not handle being out and being an adult, an adult and being a man. Like I just there were so many unanswered questions in my life. Um, and I had been exposed to pornography as, from when I can remember, was the age of five. 
until the age of 19, I was completely addicted. Um, for 14, when I was 19, I had been addicted for 14 years. And so I sort of consider myself the worst case scenario. And God did a powerful work in my life when I was 19. Um, I, I ended up taking a year off after that freshman year when I kind of had the breakdown. I went to a church um, that I ended up confessing the sin to and saying, I'm just tired of it. I can't handle this anymore. And they knew exactly what to do. Like they were the kind of church like Canterbury that's like out in the open with this stuff and, hey, let's deal with it and let's talk about it. And they sort of took me in my, under their wing. I had a lot of accountability. I went through a lot of um, I went through a lot of counseling, just dealing with the root issues, um, and also had a lot of prayer over me, just that God would supernaturally heal me, because He is our healer inside and out, and He has the ability to pull us out of anything. Like if he, He's the deliverer, and He has the ability to deliver us completely. So that's kind of, I want to give you a sense of urgency, I want it, but I also want to give you a sense of hope. I want to come from a place of this is not insurmountable, that God can deliver, and the way that he delivers is like it never happened. And that's what God did in my life. Through this, it was, multi, it was about a two-year process, intensive process where I went from being a slave to it to this sin, like the Bible in Romans talks about, you're a slave to sin if you're in sin, to being completely free, to where it's not a struggle. I mean, it's still a struggle. It's not a daily struggle because um, I was I was falling multiple times a day every day for most of my life, and so it's he's made me able to be able to have relationships again. Um, and be able to have friends and a wife and about to have a baby. And I know that if I hadn't dealt with it, if I just kept going, I wouldn't have had any of those things. Um, the, the enemy ha had it out to kill me, and he almost did. And God rescued me because I, I didn't know what to do. Like, I didn't, I didn't just decide one day that I was just going to stop. Because I'd tried that. I'd tried just my willpower. I'm just, gonna, I'm just sick of this. I'm never going to do that again. And that never works. Um, you can white knuckle it for a while, like you can hang on for dear life, but if you don't process the actual issues that are going on in your heart, you're never going to walk away from it. Um, so that's kind of my story. Um, it's just a story of God's power, really, and what he can do and what he wants to do in our society and what he wants to do with your own kids and your family and your group, of your community around you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the effects of pornography because it, it does, I want to connect human trafficking to your life because there is a direct correlation with pornography and human trafficking. And one of the biggest things I wanted to focus on is what pornography does to the brain. Now, I'm not a scientist, but there's a great website called fightthenewdrug.org that has a fantastic description of how pornography affects your brain chemically, how it affects our society, and how it affects love and relationships. And it has these great pages that with lots of research. So I'm going to kind of be pulling from that. And then I'm also pulling from um, Covenant Eyes. Though, have you all heard of Covenant Eyes? Um, Covenant Eyes is a company that makes a software filter that you can put on your machine and your computers to filter pornography for, your, for you and your family. And the CEO of the company has had written like a paper on pornography and its effects and how in and directly how it connects to human trafficking. So um, so let's get into it. So the first thing I want to just address um, in the Covenant Eyes paper, it's called Stop the Demand, the Role of Pornography in Human Trafficking. And he pulls from a lot of different sources. And so one of his sources is Laura Letterer, the former senior advisor on trafficking and persons for the U.S. State Department. She says that pornography is a brilliant social marketing campaign for commercial sexual exploitation. Porn is marketing for sex trafficking both directly and indirectly. Directly because online and offline, hubs for trafficking use those type of images. They use pornographic images sort of as advertising. Um, and they draw people into that, to that underworld culture that y'all have learned, learned about 
through pornog pornographic images. A key ingredient to the success of the human trafficking is the belief that people are commodities, that women and men are commodities that I can go and get whenever I want. They're not people that you have relationships with. They are objects to fill a void in you and to fill your heart. Um, and so pornography makes this accelerate way more than anything else because it's a instant, you know, you're, if you have an internet capable device without a filter, you are three, three finger strokes away, three keystrokes away from all of the darkness that you can imagine. And so if, if we hand our kids an iPhone at the age of 10 with no filter or nothing, you are basically, you are trusting that child to make decisions that they are medically and scientifically not able to make yet. Um, there's actually a lot of research uh, on the prefrontal cortex of a, of a child is not fully developed until about 20 years old for girls and a little bit older for guys. And so they literally don't have the ability to make these decisions. And that's what happened to me. I, was, I had access to an internet capable computer with no monitoring and no oversight and no filtering. And I did what any curious teenager kid would have done is just, what is this? What, you know, somebody makes a joke or, or I hear something on a sitcom or I hear, you know, you hear these things and you go, what is that? I wonder what that is. And my church had not talked about it like you guys do, which I think is so incredible. Um, and I just started searching for stuff. What, what is this? And my parents hadn't talked to me. And I had like the sex ed talk, you know, the, the birds and the bees and the anatomy, which does not, the anatomy does not fully describe what God's plan for sex is. I'd never heard the good side and the things to look forward to, like in marriage, and, and God's plan that he's the creator of it and it's something awesome. I had only heard, you just, no, no, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. I never knew what, there, what it was for, and I never knew what to look forward to. So pornography did that in me. It made me objectify women and look at them, look at them as body parts or look at them as an object instead of a real person. And so I know that if I wouldn't have dealt with my, with my issues, I would have seen my future wife like that. I might have missed my out on my future wife because I just saw her as an object for selfish gain and not as a, a real awesome person. Um, and it does that to our society as a whole. Like guys become incapable of having relationships because they see the world that way. Now, there's this other aspect of it that is actually chemical. So when you look at pornography, there's actually a chemical response, especially in boys, that happens. It is a, there's a release of dopamine, which is the pleasure chemical that was de God designed for in sex, in marriage, and it releases these pleasure chemicals that literally on, are on the same level as like a, like a, a really powerful drug like heroin and cocaine. There's been some scientists that have compared pornography, the, the release that comes from pornography, on that level. And it's insanely addictive. But what happens is the more you look at pornography, the more desensitized you get to it. And so you have to look at it more often. You have to look at it in weirder places, or you have to look for different things, and you just, you're constantly searching for the next high, just like an addict or, you know, somebody who drinks or an alcoholic or a drug addict. So, so this is another part of the um, porn is like a drug, which is on the fightthenewdrug.org, but it says that describing porn's effects to a U.S. Senate committee, Dr. Jeffrey Sant Satinover of Princeton University said, it is though we have devised a form of heroin usable in the privacy of one's own home, and injected directly into the brain through the eyes. That is literally what happens in your brain scientifically. Um, 
Here's another quote from that, from that same paper. Uh, this is from the Covenant Eyes paper. Using pornography, especially over long periods of time, does not just distort an individual's view on sexuality, but actually reshapes how the human brain functions. According to neuroscientist Dr. William Struthers, continued use of pornography literally erodes the prefrontal region of the brain responsible for our willpower. When our prefrontal lobes are working properly, then we have executive control of what's going on. We have the ability to say, no, that is bad. I do not want to do that. And yes, I'm going to do good because there are re there's a reward system in our brain, which they talk about. Um, it's where, so this prefrontal part of our brain is where we do abstract thinking, make goals, solve problems, regulate behavior, and where we suppress emotion, impulses, and urges. But the more one looks at pornography, the more dopamine is released in the brain. And eventually, the dopamine receptors and signals in the brain fatigue, leaving the viewer wanting more but unable to reach the, the same high, basically. The viewer becomes numb to things once considered pleasurable. So having a great day with your family or going to a sports game or watching a great movie, those things start to become less and less pleasurable, and so you go look for it in other places. Um, the viewer becomes numb, and to escape the desensitization, people, and men especially, expand their pornographic taste to more intense or novel pornography. This downward spiral of desensitization impacts the prefrontal cortex. Then when impulses and desires come, like when a sexual desire comes, um, they have no ability to deal with it. Um, instead of being moderated, the brain feels these desires are compelling needs. There's a urgent compulsion to do them. While the prefrontal region is supposed to be able to weigh consequences in situations and judiciously cut down cravings, the porn user's ability to do this is severely impaired. When the craving for sexual stimulation surfaces, their whole body gears up for action and it consumes them. The heart begins to race, blood pressure rises, and this person is completely taken over by it. And there's actually a name for this phenomenon of lost willpower, and it's called hypofrontality. So, let's, so that's what pornography does. Let's talk about social media, okay? Because social media, I think, is sort of a gateway to that, especially with new social networks like Snapchat, um, Instagram, where you can send pictures directly with no trace. Um, there are apps, uh, like Snapchat is the biggest one right now, where a child can send a picture of whatever they want to someone else's device that has a timer on it. So let's say they send a picture and it has a 10 second timer where the other person can see it for those 10 seconds and then it vanishes. There's no history, there's no proof, there's no record. Now in some situations people can save those, but I think that this kind of social media does not incentivize our kids to do the right thing, which can lead to pornographic images because, I mean, there's some stories that I've heard from my clients um, at App Instructor where, you know, a kid, th there was some story, and I don't know exactly the ages, where a younger child sent a picture of a body part that they shouldn't have, um, and this is in like junior high, and that picture was saved by a student who then sent it to all the boys in the grade. And they could not unsee that. That person's reputation was damaged. And all of a sudden, now all the parents had this in their lap, like, what, like their kids are coming home saying, this happened, and now I have no idea how to address that. I think one of the important things to understand is that the social media and this pornography struggle with the internet is such a new thing. The iPhone came out in 2007, which is eight years ago. I mean, in the internet around 1997, and it really didn't take off until the 2000s, this is such a new thing. And y'all's generation, most of y'all, like, did not have this same level of access to pornography. So the, so the parents don't know what to do, and this is typical of my clients. They just, they're scared. They're, you know, they, their kids need a device for school. They need it to get work done. But also they don't know how to monitor it or use it or know what to do with it. So it's a completely new struggle. But basically this social media disincentivizes our kids and doesn't, it doesn't lead them to make good decisions. 
And on top of that, it starts this spiral of curiosity, which is actually a normal God-given thing in a, in a young boy and a young girl to ask questions and to know what that is. And so it's this God-given sexuality with God-given curiosity that can easily lead to Google searches and internet searches and locker room conversations where they're exposed to the wrong way, the wrong viewpoint of sexuality or a, or a, a, a lower reality of what sexuality really is. So you can put filters on, and I'll, I'm going to go over that briefly um, on the Apple devices. I do not know a lot about Android devices. I mainly focus on Apple, and um, we're going to talk about where you can go to your child's device to put a filter on it and to put some kind of management on it. It's not completely robust. I mean, and there's no filter that is perfect, and you always have to understand, like, they can go to a friend's house or, you know, if a buddy at school goes, hey, check this out. There's, there's no way to completely insulate your child, but having a great relationship with them can, and putting filters, and having a great community and a great church can really beat this thing. And in just talking about it in the open, like the fact that y'all are here is amazing. So I want to commend y'all for coming here and, and, and wanting to deal with this. So, um, so I guess what I want to talk about now is how you can talk to your child. Because, or you're someone that you know is going through this or struggling with this. The main thing that my main advice for talking to your children about this is to do is to not include any kind of shame when you talk to them. This is not a you're a bad boy. Can't believe you did that. Oh my gosh, cuz sometimes your knee jerk reaction if you were to find something like that would be to do that. It would be to oh my gosh, I can't believe cuz you're freaking out inside and you don't know what to do. And so you have to address it in a loving way that this is a normal struggle, this is a normal thing that is out there. Hey, I know you're going to experience this one day. Let's talk about it. Let's deal with it. Let's, let's just get it on the table, because if it's on the table, then we can, uh, we can fight it together. But if we hide everything and we keep it, you know, you don't want to, it's embarrassing, or, they, or it's like, ooh, gross, mom, I don't want to talk, you know, dad, I don't want to talk about that. We've got to get this out on the table. But the other thing is, I believe a really powerful tool for, com for connecting and communicating with your child is to be vulnerable yourself. And that's not just, if you, it's basically just talking about things that you've struggled with. And I think in, our, in, a, in the Southern culture, I've seen that that's not a very common practice because we're supposed to kind of have our stuff together and, and get our image together and we want to look good to other people. And it's not a natural thing to be extremely vulnerable with your child, even at a younger age. Just, hey, I struggled with some things. Like, I went through depression or I went through relationship problems. Um, so being open and honest and talking about it is a huge way to deal with this. Um, because, like, when in my situation, I went to a Christian school, went to a Christian church, and nobody talked about it. Nobody addressed this. And so to me, if you don't address it, what happens is the child's mind or the adolescent's mind thinks that it's an off-limits topic, which, which makes you think that it, is, it must be really bad. Like if this is something that all my buddies are talking about, but my mom and dad aren't or my church isn't, this must be like real bad. So I'm going to hide even more. I'm not going to bring it up because man, it's just one of those, we just don't talk about that thing, kind of thing. So that's why I think it's so great what y'all are doing. So talking, about your, talking to your kids about it, setting strict but fair limits on technology. So having bedtimes and having timers, you know, and monitoring the amount of time that's being spent. Because again, I don't believe that a child ha or an adolescent has the ability to make good decisions on how much time to use it. So it, we as a society... <laughs> And up here, we got a shaking of the head. Um, it's <laughs> he just said I'm ruining his whole world over here. Um, <laughs> um, well, what happens though is that there is a addictive, there is an addictive nature to the devices just themselves, 
it's it's infinite knowledge. I mean, if you want to Google search any anything good, you can learn whatever you want to learn. If I don't have my iPhone, I feel like my lim- one of my limbs was cut off. And, you know, and it's and it's it is it is a way that we stay connected to each other. But sometimes we get more into the device themselves than the interact or the the digital interaction than with actual human interaction. And so setting a setting the bar and setting the tone for your kids is really important because they don't necessarily know how to moderate that themselves and you will one day (laughs) but maybe not right now nobody can Um, technology is not inherently bad on its own it's the way that humans use it that is bad (laughs) the iPhone sitting on a desk does not hurt anybody but when you give it in the hands of a person it can do a lot of damage So learning to be good citizens with technology is a huge deal because you cannot also just take your child out of the the world completely. I mean, you can at certain ages, but at some point they're going to have to rely on it for work or school or whatever else because everything is becoming more dependent on that. Paying your bills is online, doing schoolwork, doing homework, all of that is going online, and so they've got to learn how to have good boundaries with it. And you have to set the tone yourself by having good time frames yourself, not, you know, always doing this instead of talking to people. Um, so it's a tough problem, but that's a great way to, to address it. You can put filters on your household, and I can, I can help you with that. Um, which we'll talk about more later, but you can actually, I can actually come to your house and help filter. I mean, again, there's no filter that's perfect, but if you combine a filter with something like this, this conversation and having an open, vulnerable relationship, um, you can be a resource for your child. Like that's what I, that's what I believe is God in, God's intention for parents is for, for you as a parent or a grandparent to be the, the go-to resource for your, for your kid or grandkid when the questions come up. And so if you set yourself up as a vulnerable, open resource where there's nothing off limits, there's nothing you've been vulnerable to, and you've opened the door for that conversation, there can be a really healthy talks that go on that aren't, that aren't weird and that aren't like, ew, gross, and can really change the trajectory of your child's life. Because the trajectory of my life was, I mean, I was so depressed that I was literally suicidal my freshman year. I was not on a good path. And if I hadn't talked to somebody, if I would have talked to my parents when I was five, I would have been fine. Or I would have at least started to deal with that one degree of separation where I was headed in a bad path. So. Another thing I want to address that I feel like, especially like in this community in Mountain Brook, like I used to be a brookie, (laughs) so I sort of understand a little bit about the culture and a lot of my clients are, but a a concern I hear a lot is from parents is like, if I lock these devices down, my kid's just going to get made fun of, or like, they're just going to be that weird kid that whose weird mom doesn't let them do anything. (laughs) I'm getting arm nudges over here. Um... (laughs) But here's what I want to say to that. Do you value your child's popularity or their purity? Do you value their ability to fit in or their ability to live and walk in their destiny? That's what you have to see it as. Junior high popularity is such a temporary thing. It feels huge at the time. It feels like the, your whole world is crashing down if that's not there or if, that, if, if that's an issue. But in reality, it's going to change their life potentially for them to be a little bit unpopular for a few years it can completely change their life and the other thing is if our society is addicted to per- to porn do you really want them fitting in in that society like at some point we have to be in the world but not of it we've got to be awesome full people that are full of life and are capable of having a great full life, but we might not have some of the luxuries of the world. That's just who we're called to be as Christians. So I would urge you to kind of pray about those boundaries with your kids, because again, everybody's, everybody's child is different. Every age, it's different. Um, I think that counseling and prayer ministry is a huge tool 
Um, if you if you believe that somebody you love is addicted, um, that is one of the massive tools that they can they can use to get out of that. Um, and that's what that was a massive tool for me. And that was I would say is probably the crucial aspect of what I went through was talking through the issues of the heart because I truly believe that pornography is a symptom. It is a symptom of something else going on. There's a need that's not getting met in me. Or there is a, there's a hole that I'm trying to fill, and that can be looking like it could be the place that God is supposed to take in our hearts and the Holy Spirit is supposed to take in our hearts. But it can also be things that were hurtful that were done to them or, like in my situation, abuse. The reason that I was so drawn to pornography is because there was something broken inside. So dealing with the broken the parts inside and what I've seen in, in counseling, I counseled a lot of students in, at Sanford when I was there out of pornography, and we had this awesome guys group that would deal with it. But what we found was when you dealt with those broken issues of the heart, it, the need and that drive to look at it, it, it withered away. It, it became a, a habit I had to break and not a, com, a drive and a burning fire because the, it, it, that burning fire comes from the heart. So getting counseling, getting prayer ministry, getting help is a huge part of this. Um, a couple of things quickly that I'll deal with, and then I want to open up for a quick Q&A, and I also want to um, t- take about a minute on the iPhone and iPad. Um, I think that setting up a healthy reward system for your family that's built around relationships is really important. Um, which is, I don't know how to define that for your family, but basically the reward needs to be relationships-based. So if you do this, then we can, you get to spend time with somebody, or we're going to have a family trip if you guys get good grades. You know, a lot of times what we want to do is use the reward as the device, and I don't know if that necessarily, like if that's the only reward that is held, then that may, that may not be as beneficial as you think because, again, they just want to do things to get to the device. Does that make sense? Um, again, and I don't know how to define that for your particular family, but I'd love to, I'm available to talk about that. And then the last thing is a lot of, what I've seen a lot of success with my clients is building a, a trust plan, which is basically sitting down and saying, okay, I know, you're my kid, I love you, but you are going to leave me one day. <laughs> you are, when you were 18, you were going to go to college, and I'm going to have z- almost zero control over what you do with this device, with your life, with your relationships, with girls, with boys, whatever. I'm not going to always be here. And so you have to plan around that. You've got to build in a, a it's almost like a ramp to freedom for them in terms of getting your child to start exercising their own self-will and their own discipline instead of just tightening the wrenches on them. Because that's the other thing that if, if we approach this problem with fear, that's what most parents do is they just start to squeeze the life out. You know, you can't, you know, they, they try to grip them so tightly that guess what happens when they turn, when they turn 18? They run wild. They, they, everything in them wants to do the opposite of what you said because it was too tough. It was, it was not trusting them and not, believe, like not trusting God in them to learn how to make some decisions. And not all of them, like not, because again, like we talked about, the decision-making process is not fully there, but it needs to gradually increase. So letting, giving your child some freedom, letting them make some of their own decisions is a huge, a huge part of this as well. And again, I want to be a resource for y'all. Um, I think that dealing with pornography, if, if our society does not deal with it, we're on the verge of a huge catastrophe. Because what I'm seeing and what I saw in college at Sanford was a bunch of awesome, godly women, young women, and a bunch of guys that had no idea what to do with them, that had no idea how to relate to them, that had no idea to how to connect with them in a healthy way, and that did not have the personal integrity to even feel like they could date them 
or marry and have children with. So we're going to see this massive divide of these awesome women, I mean, who are, again, like, who don't have the same intense struggle, and these guys that, that are completely crippled, that are completely cut off from their destinies because they're, they're in bondage to this. So I believe that it's a huge issue, and it will lead to human trafficking because, it, and I don't want everybody to think, well, every single person that looks at pornography is going to go into human trafficking or is going to hire somebody. But I do want you to see the correlation that you weaken their willpower, you take their masculinity, really, because what pornography offers is a false sense of masculinity, what masculinity and femininity is. So if you want to use me as a resource, you can go to my website, which is appinstructor.com, and you can come up here and get this. I've got some cards, um, and I would love to talk to you about anything, um, if it's doing the technology side, if it's, you know, how to talk to your child, if it's anything, I'm, I want to be a resource for that. Um, and you can, you can actually hire me, and I'll come to your house, and we can talk about these issues. Um, I can talk to your kids. There are a few of my clients where I've spoken to their child, ch children directly on some issues. Um, so, so let's open it up for a couple of questions, and then I want to dive in for just like a minute on the iPhone. So does anybody have any qu questions real quick for me? I know we covered a lot, um, but I hope this is helpful. So do you all have any questions for me? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you kind of expound on really the, the, the way that it really does lead to human trafficking. Um, so <coughs> yeah, the, the direct the, path. The, the way that it broadens and gets there. Yeah, so what, what, it, what the question was is how does it, how does someone go from pornography to human trafficking? And usually, and I sort of touched on this, but thank you for calling me to that, Aaron. What happens is, like we talked about, there's that search for the novel new thing. That the old things that I used to look at don't trigger me as much. So I've got to start looking for d novel and weirder and weirder things. And then eventually those images aren't enough anymore. I need to have a human. I need, like, I I'm going to go look for real interaction. I'm going to go look for real sex that with a real person because maybe that will fill the hole that I've been trying to fill. And so it can lead to really bad relationships. That's usually where it starts, just like really unhealthy boyfriends, girlfriends. But down the road, if not dealt with, it can easily lead to hiring prostitutes and can lead to participating in that and maybe even becoming a producer in that area if that's something that has been going on for a long time, and the, if there's been abuse, then especially it can lead there. Does that kind of answer your question? Okay. Isn't it a danger also for, uh, say, a 12, 13 year old girl who goes on the internet and she doesn't have any boyfriends and uh, she gets tempted over the internet, not really pornography, but just uh, tempted by someone who wants to set up a date with her or something? Yeah, so the question was isn't it tempting for a girl or like for someone on the internet to maybe meet? somebody or maybe start a relationship up definitely a lot of times when in my in my experience counseling if if somebody if a girl or a, or a boy has had father wounds meaning they did not get what they what God intended for a father to give to a child they can start to look for relationships online so I want to meet up with somebody or I want you know hey you seem cool I want to I'm gonna look for that need in a either a younger boy or an older man, or an older man than I thought was a younger boy that lied to me and now they're kidnapped and taken into the sex trade. So that is definitely another way that can happen. Um, and, and I have had some experience with, with some younger children reaching out to older adults because of some abuse that had happened um, and almost having a meetup and, and getting the government involved. So it definitely can tie directly to that. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other? Those are great questions. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. You talked about the setting up of a reward system in your home and banking out on relationships. I just didn't quite get what you were trying to say. Can you do a for instance? 
Yes. Okay. Thank you. So what I mean, she, the question was, what do you mean by a reward system in the family? So in every family, there's a, there's setup of if you do your homework, then you get X. And that's, that's sort of what your family reward system is. If you clean your room and do this, then you are going to get this. And so there's a way, and I don't fully, I don't have a lot of, I'm going to give you some examples, but there's examples that y'all are going to think of that I haven't thought of yet because I'm not a parent yet. But, hey, we're going to have this family trip to the beach or to the lake. And if you do these things, then we're going to get to be together. We're going to get to have a fun time. Not that you're not going to get to go or whatever, but it's like looking at the most important thing in your family as y'all being together. So, hey, we're going to have this family game night, but you got to do your homework and you got to you got to be able to participate in that you need to get the stuff done just creating little rewards that lead to time spent quality time spent so using quality time and mixing that in with your other rewards like an allowance or whatever does that make sense okay cool any other questions yes ma'am Definitely. Um, so the question was, do you think that you showed any signs of depression or anxiety that my parents or somebody could have picked up on? And I think the answer is yes. I definitely showed signs. And I can't totally tell you why that those weren't picked up on. I do know that a loving, like caring parent that's looking for that can miss it. But also, you can, got, with God's help, you can pick up on it because there are definite signs like withdrawal, um, lots of shame, or pulling away that are not just teenage thing. You know, I, I think that's kind of what that genera- my parents' generation would think. Oh, they're just teenagers. They just like, you know, mom and dad are just, I don't want to have anything to do with them. They're just going to go and just play video games. Because that was what my that was what my one of my other escapes was, I mean, six to eight hours a day video games, and I would just escape and, and withdraw that way, it, which doesn't necessarily I wasn't acting out like setting things on fire or like drinking and partying. It was quiet, very withdrawal, really quiet withdrawal. So. I can't speak to why my parents didn't pick up on that um, or why people around me didn't pick up on that, um, but I do think that I showed signs. So, anything else? Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank y'all so much. I'll be available for questions. Thank y'all. Yeah, I'll be hanging around if you guys want to talk to me over here. Thank y'all so much for coming. Oh, yes. Okay, let's briefly do that really quick. Um, If you'll just write this down if you've got notes or put it in your iPhone. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Yes. They can be good used correctly. Um, So the place that you go to limit a device is in settings and then general and then restrictions. And inside that page of your settings, you can set a code. So you can set a restrictions passcode. That's just a four-digit code that your child should never know, where you can turn off certain features of the iPhone, like installing apps. Like if you want them to not have Snapchat, you can turn off the App Store. If you want to filter the internet, you go to the websites section, and you turn on. You can actually set to restrict adult content. Um, and then you can do some, a few other things, but those are the two main things, turning off the App Store and limiting the websites. So again, I'll be up front if y'all want to ask more in detail questions, and I'm also available to come to your house. So thank y'all for coming, and y'all have a good night. First thing I want to do is just say wow. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you, Canterbury, for inviting us here over and over again, for showing us support. Um, It really means a lot. My name is Shauna and I am a sex trafficking survivor. 
I am a Magdalene graduate, and Magdalene is a two-year residential program for women who have survived life of human trafficking, drugs, addiction, prostitution. The very most important thing that I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to light this candle. We do this every day at Thistle Farms and Magdalene, and I'm going to ask you all, if you do get a candle, that you do it too, because the reason we light this candle is for the lady who has lost her way, who is still out there on the street, the one who will pick up the drug for the first time, and the baby who will be born into this without a choice in the matter. Um, I want to tell my story, but we don't have very much time, so I'm going to do like a quick version. But, um, so I was born 1974, drug addicted. My mother, um, whom I love, and I hate the disease of addiction, uh, was a heroin addict. I was sent to live with my grandparents, and my grandfather was an alcoholic, and he molested me. I'm not sure how early that started, but it just was always so. Twelve years old, my grandmother passed, and I was sent to live with my mother. And I just remember being in an apartment one day and this guy being there and he was an older gentleman and when he left she said he thinks you're cute. And I thought gross. I yes. <laughs> the very next week we went up the hill and I remember her knocking on this gentleman's door and I remember going into the apartment and I remember them injecting me with drugs and that's when my mother sold me. I ended up with this man for the next six years. He would beat me, he would trade me. He had me drug addicted. And one day I said, I'm leaving here. I'm getting out of here. My grandmother's dead. I don't know where my mother is. I don't have any family and where am I gonna go? I ended up on the streets of Nashville and met these people. And he said, oh, you can come with us, and we'll take care of you, and you can call me dad. My wife's going to be your mom, and there's all these other girls, and we're going to give you clothes, and we're going to give you drugs, and we're going to take care of you. All I ever wanted was a family, right? So this was great. I was trafficked for the next 10 years all across the United States. No worse feeling in the world than pulling up in a strange city and being told, get out and get my money and don't come back without it. And you know what happens if you don't. Finally, God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And the pimp was arrested and sent to the federal penitentiary. And there was a public defender by the name of Jonathan Wing. And I said, I need help. And there's this place and I've heard of it. And it's called the Magdalene House. It's for women just like me. He said, I've heard of the Magdalene House, but do you know that they have a waiting list? I said, I do. He said, it's about 150 women, and you're going to have to wait in jail. And I said, thank you. Because no one had ever raped me in jail. No one had ever made me work the streets in jail. And I was just tired. And I'm not tired about being up for 12 days tired. I'm talking about I thought I wanted to die. But that wasn't the case. I wanted to live and I just didn't know how. And I needed someone to help to show me how. And this is where Magdalene comes into play. So I, I remember going to court and they said, Magdalene House is coming to get you and I got really scared. I have trust no one tattooed across my chest. I told you my story and I thought, wow, I'm going to end up back on the streets because I don't know what these people are going to want from me, but they're going to want something because everybody does. And I got there and they said, if you'll do this much, we'll do the rest. I said, I knew they wanted something, right? Because I did not have that much of myself to give. I didn't. But that's okay because they loved me until I could learn to love myself. Every woman's individual program is different at Magdalene, and mine consisted of SAC, which is the Sexual Assault Center, and I did not want to go. I said, why do I have to go do this? 
I just want to let it go. It happened. I just want to move on with my life. And I don't want to just, why do we have to keep talking about it? But that is where I found healing. That is where I learned to love a little girl named Shauna. That's all she wanted was to be loved, right? That's where I learned to love her. And I learned to trust her. And then I began to grow and bloom. And they said, do you want to go to work at Thistle Farms? I said, I have a sixth grade education. I've never had a job. And I have 167 arrests on my record. Are you sure you want me to go to work? They said, yeah, this is for you. Come on. And I got there, and they sent me to school on Fridays at Belmont for computers. And I, do you know what I found out? I had been told my whole life how stupid I was. That was the biggest lie. I am so smart. <laughs> really? Right? Without Matt going through some fun, I wouldn't know this. I got on the sales team. I started to help manage about 430 counts, retail stores. I travel around. I tell my story. And people say, how can you do that over and over? You just keep reliving that trauma. I said, I do that because it's not my story anymore. It's a little girl's story who's being molested today. And it's another little girl's story who's being sold today. And it's that girl's story who's on the street meeting her first pimp that's going to tell her, don't come back without that money. Because it's happening. Right now, as we're sitting in this room, it's happening. And so I tell that story for her. And I light that candle for her. And I sell a lip balm, and I sell a candle, because there's another lady that's going to come along that's going to say, you want to give me a job? And we're going to say yes, because it's for her. So that's why we're here today, and um, that's what my life is about today. And it makes everything that happened up to this point okay. It does, because I have a plan and I have a purpose. And I thank you all so much for having us here. I don't want to hold you up, because I want everybody to be able to get their candle and light it. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. And let's remember when we're lighting our candle while we're lighting. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Doris, and I'm a very grateful thistle farmer, and I'm so grateful I've got my life back. I was on the streets for like 26 years, came into the Magdalene program in 2009, and life is good today. Uh, but I, what I want, came up for, I wanted to sing a song. So when I, before my addiction took place, I used to go to church with my mom and father, and I used to sing in the choir. So when I finally got my life back, I realized that music truly is food for the soul. So I wrote this song about Magdalene Thistle Farms, and this song names our products. And in my mind, when I sing them, you all are going to rush out there and get your products, right? <laughs> so, but the name of the song is I Am a Thistle Farmer. I'm a Thistle farmer, and Thistle Farms is where I work. We make body butter, bomb, and polish our life whistle when I work. We come together, honing hands, in the circle where we meet. Lip balm smooth as candles burning bright, and this new paper is really me. You see, Becca Steve started this thing over ten years ago. So come on by and get our products with them you at the door. I'm a Thistle Farmer, and Thistle Stop Cafe is here to stay. You'll be glad that you're a customer. You smile as you walk away. We make lotion, soap, and shower gel. The rooms right the way you like. Healing oils, geranium too, and books that are out of sight. Hey, 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 I'm a Thistle Farmer, and Thistle Farming is what I do. So come on by, volunteer, we'll make you a farmer 